Direct from Foxborough, Massachusetts, the gem of Norfolk County, and taped at the studios of Foxborough Cable Access, it's Foxborough Central. And here's your host, Bob Hickey. And welcome to another episode of Foxborough Central. I am Bob Hickey, your host, thanking you for taking a little bit of time to join with me and my guests as we talk about the people, events, and organizations that make Foxborough truly the gem of Norfolk County. And uh, here in Foxborough, we are blessed to be represented by good folks who do good service, uh, both uh, in elected paid as well as volunteer. Tonight, we are honored to be joined by our state senator, Jim Timothy, long serving and a longer friend. How are you doing tonight? Very, very well. Thanks so much for having me, Bob. So, Jim, uh, I, you need no introduction, I'm sure, to the constituency, but I will share that uh, uh, my first time uh, bumping into you is uh, back in the day when you're volunteering here as a guest auctioneer. Yes. Uh, back when we used to do the uh, cable auctions. So, uh, the do little home. From the little home, and uh, you look just as handsome now as you did back then. I, on the other hand, am, well, I'm here. So anyway, <laughs> uh, thank you for taking time to come out and uh, spend a half hour with us and talk about what's going on up on Beacon Hill. It was great to be here. It's a, it's a very busy time on Beacon Hill. We have the new administration, uh, so things have uh, changed. They're about a year into it, uh, and things are moving along at a rapid pace. There was a little... Uh, issue between the two branches, meaning uh, the Senate and the House over the rules. So we got off to a slow start. Typically yeah. the spring, things gear up a little bit quicker, but I think that's been resolved largely. And uh, the issue has been, I think, not fixed, but set aside. Well, there was a new leadership in place, right? Correct. And so I suppose water always has to find a level. Right. It was, yeah, Senate President Rosenberg um, took over. And in his effort of uh, what he calls shared leadership, he really wants people, the, the members of the Senate, uh, many of whom are in a leadership position and or have a committee chair, to have a say in what happens, not just through the uh, microcosm of what's happening at their committee, but overall. And there were some senators who would express some frustration that bills that they had filed, you, know, you file 7,000 bills and only about 700 get done. So you get one in 10 chance and many of those that get done are home rules. So bills of significant substance are, are rare because you're, at a, you're in a 200 person mm -hmm. town meeting, essentially. You have 40 members in one branch, 160 in the other. Uh, many of us all crave immortality and think we've got it the right way and it's, it's our perspective. And I think you learn pretty quick down at the town meeting floor that unless you can get to the majority or better, uh, it doesn't often happen. But I think what many of the uh, members in my branch were kind of frustrated that bills wouldn't get, wouldn't see the light of the chamber, whether they had a chance for up or down, mm -hmm. it would die in committee. So they wanted to make certain that all Senate bills at least found their way into the Senate and not die in a, in a joint committee. Now, uh, I'm going to ask you this next question, but we'll preface it by saying uh, Jim is a long-serving uh, member of the legislature. You were first elected to the state senate in what year? 2004. 2004, and uh, this being 2015, we can say that you are a seasoned veteran yes. of the political uh, hijinks and, and flow, <laughs> yeah. uh, depending upon which uh, way you want to take a look at it. But So would you say that under uh, Senate President Rosenberg that things are, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but are they smoother, different? Is it something where it took people uh, a little bit of time to get in with the new flow, or is it such a, a diametric change that uh, things had to be reconfigured? I, I, I would have to think that I did pretty well. I was a rookie under uh, Senate President Travellini, so it wasn't there wasn't much that was going on, you know, as a, as a rookie. Um, you know, you have a chair, I was chair of municipality, so I saw a lot of bills that came through because it's all home rules, which provided a pretty excellent start to my career up there because I got to meet just about all of the members of the House of Representatives because they're all bringing the house, they're all bringing their home rules to the committee I shared. So it was, mm -hmm. a, it was I didn't look for that committee, but it was a great advantage. And then three years in, Terry Murray put me into public safety and homeland security that chair, uh, which is, it's the committee that focuses on corrections, on police, on fire, on building code, amusement devices, and firearms. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, wildly interesting, and I've kept that committee for now nine years. We talked about that the last time you were in yeah. with us. It, time flies, folks, and uh, it's been a couple years since you've been with us. Yes. So uh, yeah. I'm so glad that you came in. And the, uh, in addition to the town of Foxborough, you are from Walpole, and uh, 
You know, I've always said you're my favorite Democrat, so uh, we, uh, we, well, thank we, you. we've we enjoyed you. You once called me your favorite Republican. I don't know if that holds true or not. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll take the credit. If, in Fox Road Central, title. you better believe it does. <laughs> so uh, what other communities do you serve? I represent Medfield, Foxborough, Walpole, Sharon, Mansfield, Norton, Attleboro, Rehoboth, and Seekonk. It's a pretty large territory. Yeah, got 160,000 uh, residents You know, when you split it up doing the census, and my uh, district always grows because people are moving here. Mm -hmm. um, this is it's it's a wonderful area of New England, and you look at it when you say beautiful Foxborough, the gem of Norfolk County. When when you do a national broadcast of the Patriots, they put their cameras down to take a look at the common because that's what the country you know that's what they want to see. That's iconic uh, New England small town perfect living. That's the postcard that they want to see. So it just Joe's. I have a, I have a wonderful district. I've been blessed to you know it's a privilege and honor to work in the Senate and to represent, uh, I, like I, I have, I have 160,000 bosses. Well, uh, those 160,000 bosses certainly do see you a lot. I've uh, commented before, and I'll say it again, that you seem to be just about everywhere all the time, which, uh, and, and I know you've got a family at home, young kids. Yep. I, don't, I don't know if they're still young anymore. Yeah, it, it's, uh, eight and 11. Eight and 11, so uh, you know, it, it's you know, a lot of credit to them for sharing you with us. But uh, I, I know that this being the season, you were just down uh, the road at a Halloween uh, parade, and yeah. uh, you've been also battling some illness and, and doing all the things up on Beacon Hill, which is your job. So thank you so much for all that work. Tonight, though, let's get an update. You've been doing a lot of hard work. Let's uh, talk about, I'm not going to go quite McNeil Lair on you, but let's uh, shoot some topics out and see where we go, sure. shall we? Uh, and before that, of course, I'm speaking with Jim Timothy, who is our state senator. And for those of you interested in contacting the good senator directly, uh, you can uh, email him at james.timothy at massenate.gov. Sorry, not massenate, massenate.gov. He's also a Facebook friend. Maybe not to you, but once you friend him, he'll be your friend too. So you can friend him on Facebook or you can tweet him on Twitter. So for those of you who are so inclined, his office is definitely able to be communicated with. Of course, uh, folks like me, we tend to just uh, pick up the phone and call him. He's always responsive. He's always answered my phone calls. 617-722-1222. Jim Timothy, let's talk about some fun stuff and not so fun stuff. Actually, let's start off on the not so fun. Huge issue these days of, uh, it's in the news, um, and we have a, a local, um, uh, Chris Long is a, a very strong advocate, as well as some others, uh, the opiate crisis that we keep reading about. Narcan uh, is creating a positive dent. I know the District Attorney Morrissey here uh, in Norfolk is, is very much a proponent of that. Our own police department is on the right side of the bell curve yeah. when it comes to dealing with the issue, and yet it keeps seemingly getting worse and worse yeah. and worse. And recently in Boston, there were a number of, um, of, of new, a new round of deaths, and there's now yeah. being something laced in with the yeah. Uh, fentanyl. I, just, yeah, fentanyl. I, I just don't feel as though we know enough information because the information happens so quickly. So can you give oh, us an update? It's, it's, it's an epidemic and it's, it's the number one problem, I think, uh, in the country and certainly in the Commonwealth. Uh, when you think I had, I had the opportunity to be appointed along with uh, Senator Tolman to an OxyContin commission in 2008 and we toured the state and it was an eye opener for me because I wasn't aware, you know, maybe not necessarily sheltered. It's, it's, addiction is not too far from anyone's, anyone's family in some form or another, whether it be drugs, whether it be alcohol, tobacco, credit cards, uh, gambling. Uh, there are many addictions, but uh, the fact that this end of life drug, uh, oxycodone, oxycontin, or Percocet, some of these really powerful painkillers, which are designed to help people in the throes of as I say, end of life in many instances, mm -hmm. are getting in the hands of teenagers. And it's a recipe for disaster. Just for, for instance, in that 2009 our, uh, OxyContin Commission report that we came up with, we did the 2005 budget and tried to find how much state spending was attributable to um, substance abuse okay. problems. And when you take a look at you know, 80% of those incarcerated in the, either the House of Correction or the Department, State Department of Corrections, 70 to 80% of those have an addiction problem is the root of why they were there. They stole, they offended, they dealt, they assaulted people. And in feeding, some cases, feeding the addiction. Feeding the addiction is, and you talk about mass health and the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services, about 22% of our $25 billion budget 
is directly related. So this is money that's going for incarceration, for care, for um, rehabilitation, although not enough. And you think, where could that money be spent, whether it be on education, whether it be on health care, whether it be on transportation? Mm -hmm. You know, this is, it's, it's really important for us to try to get our hands around it. And I think the most important thing we can do, and I spent this morning at Attleboro High School, uh, I helped sponsor the event. Chris Heron and his Hoop Dreams came down, and this is the third time he's been down in Attleboro to talk to the kids, and they pulled every freshman and every sophomore out for two hours so they could hear his story, they could understand what happened to him. This is a, a McDonald's Top 50 All-American, one of the top 15 uh, kids uh, growing up from Durfee in basketball, had the world ahead of him, mm -hmm. and because he dabbled and started small, drinking in somebody's basement or in the woods and then just took a step and a step and a step. He ended up being on drugs for 14 years, uh, drove his children around. He has a very po powerful story of what addiction did to him and how he's come out on the other side. And it was a, it was a riveting uh, hour and a half, not a, not a, nobody moved. You know, it was a full assembly. And it's, I, I think that one of our most important things that we can work on is from households, from neighborhoods, from communities, and, and everywhere in the Commonwealth is education and prevention. And we need to spend more money on really rehabilitation. We need to give kids an opportunity once they've gone down this path to not get two days or three days in a spin dry. We have to give them a chance to get 30 days, 90 days away so that they can, brain can rewire itself back because the uh, synthetic opi the synthetic uh, drugs, the, the, which is a synthetic opiate, mm -hmm. um, is they take over the neuroreceptors so the kids keep having to keep chase that high. And also, as, uh, as uh, Chris Aaron eloquently spoke, a, a child had asked him, hey, you know, why didn't you just play basketball without it? He said, I couldn't without the heroin when it was in the throes of that addiction because I'd be too sick to move. I'd be in the fetal position. So it's, uh, it's, it's every, I think every, everybody's understanding, uh, but the, the totality, when you look at the, the sum of all the, all the parts and all the communities of what this is doing to the Commonwealth, what this is doing to families, it's, uh, it's our most important issue before us. It, everything else is secondary. And uh, I think that, Many, you know, police officers, um, all, kinds, all kinds of cross community, cross sections, community leaders are getting together and, and working to try, to try to address this. Well, it's also a topic, and again, I'm certainly no uh, expert by any means, but in just in touching the different people I interview here on the program and seeing how far reaching and insidious it is because it affects families, but also the cost of crime and then incarceration and treatment but also in jobs with lost time and lost yeah. productivity with theft and the companies that, you know, the stores that uh, lose productivity but lose merchandise. And then you have the police resources that have to spend time doing this and, and dealing with the, the, the fallout of the uh, opiate crisis. And then you circle back to the people themselves, lost lives and yeah. lost relationships and, you know, broken people. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, the receptors get uh, misfired and, and, yeah. and, the, and the addiction becomes such a, a disease that overwhelms, it's not a simple solution. And I think you mentioned the beginning where people sometimes don't think it happens. I think part of it is that we're so overwhelmed by the question that you don't really know where to start. Yeah. So how does one start to address this? And you're on that committee, yeah. but um, it's just so overwhelming of a topic. And it's not, and it's not an easy fix. And it's not it's Foxborough not, alone. It's certainly yeah. everywhere, but we everywhere. have it here. In everywhere, Foxborough. everywhere. I think it's you know it, it should be uh, our number one mission in school, in in your place of worship, in your household, in you know neighborhood groups, and the scouts is just educating kids to make a better choice, stay away away from these destructive choices because if you do start down that road. No matter when, and there are there are stories, and and I heard them of construction workers who hurt themselves, or athletes who've hurt themselves, and hadn't had any substance abuse issues, and were far along in life, but then maybe having some sort of internal predilection or just some sort of trigger mm -hmm. where it 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 has an ability to to get them very quickly, and it's a very very quick slide into what you said, the very costly aspects, because many, many of these people are gonna end up, not there aren't enough beds, and they'll do something in order to feed the addiction because they're so de desperate that they'll wind up in the House of Correction or they'll wind up 
at the State Department of mm -hmm. Correction, and that's forty-four to fifty-two thousand dollars a year to care for that inmate. There's a better way. Uh, there's a better way to better way to spend that. Of course, you know, I've, I always get in the argument with people about minimum mandatory sentences. And minimum mandatory sentences, while some people are looking for the first time nonviolent drug offender, they're not incarcerated. I've done, you know, I've done, we've done a lot of That's talking. That's already happened. Yeah, so. they, they've, they've, already, they've already got their breaks. Right. But we have to have strong penalties for drug dealers and drug suppliers mm -hmm. because of what it's cost in the Commonwealth. I mean, in not, just, not just in dollars, but in lives and in families and in households. So uh, it's, you know, there's, there's many, many facets to dealing with this. I don't have uh, all the answers. I'm just, you know, one little part uh, trying to do what I can with my vote, with my voice and in the community to help anybody, anybody who needs it and to evolve in our public policy the way we do things. So one, we're doing everything we can for pre prevention, but we're spending more and not just the government, but also the private sector, the insurance companies and the hospitals are spending more to rehabil rehabilitate because it's, I don't ha it's, it's anecdotal, but I do believe when a doctor has some problems with uh, opiates, they go away for 90 days. And at this point, if you had somebody, if you try to refer somebody to get, to get a bed, there is a wait. There's and a oftentimes you have to tell them to use in order that they can go in and get that. I, I, had, a, I had a parent on a conference call with, in very early in my Senate career saying, I can't believe I have to tell my child to do this, but in order to get him where we have to get him, it has to happen. It's called playing Scary. the system and you have to, you have to make it, and it's unfortunate Scary. and it should be a better way. You're right, absolutely. So, uh, you know, and I think that all, uh, everybody's working on it. I think we just have to, we have to work harder and have to get better. Well, it's, as, as treatment processes or, or treatment uh, can increase uh, their awareness and, and improve, their ability to attack the problem. There always seems to be a new, uh, new way to make the problem even worse. So it seems like it's a constant struggle, a constant battle. Yeah, and, um, and there are and there are some you know some very evil organizations uh, that are you know down the line on the supply chain. You know all the way you know for these these pills are coming uh, into the, getting into the hands of some very bad people, and they're giving them to kids, and they're ruining our country. So, Jim Timelty, our state senator, thank you so much for that. Let's now move on to uh, something that's equally troubling, but in a different way. Um, you know, I know that we have uh, had some positives uh, right now. It seems as though our roads here in Foxborough are looking great. A lot of that goes to the uh, uh, passage many years ago of at the local level of the meals tax and hotel tax increase that's devoted specifically to a 50-50 split between our our retirement uh, benefits obligation, OPEP. OPEP, and our highways. And so that's something that uh, I know you don't live here, but I'm going to say I hope we continue to do because that's the promise that was made. But on top of that, above and beyond it, you're saying, uh, before we went on the air, you're mentioning that Chapter 90 funds, yeah. which is traditionally what we call cherry sheet funding, yeah. uh, there's been some influx of money. Yes. Tell us about that. Yeah. The, st the <clears throat> uh, governor, first thing he did uh, was he authorized an extra $100 million. So there was $300 million for Chapter 90, and it's one of the formulas, one, that I can explain to a taxpayer, and two, that they can understand readily, because it's a formula, there's not, there's not much in it other than it goes to a community based on how many miles of roads you have. Okay. So it does work out, and I think that the uh, town meeting was, was prescient in, in d really putting, one, we're gonna fund OPEB, because we have to, mm -hmm. we're gonna keep the system, you know, Solvent, solvent. Yep. <laughs> and, which is a, a, a novel thing for government, for, uh, for government uh, uh, to think of. You don't always hear that out of government. Yeah. But, uh. Uh, and also the chapter 90, so people can see, you know, they have a tangible, you know, understanding of, wait a minute, we're gonna ask to, you're gonna ask us to tax a little bit more and we're actually gonna see something. There's gonna be a benefit for our tires, for our alignments, for, and for public safety as well. And, and that- also for the way people view your community. Yeah. If, they, if you drive through and you know what communities keep up the roads and which ones don't. And it's not always the easiest task, particularly living here in New England, but uh, I know that our uh, Department of Public Works uh, Director Roger Hill has some pretty inventive ways of, uh, of applying new technologies. So I, I think there's a combination of good people and good funding in place, so. And I think people won't mind either paying, or paying the tax if they know that there's some 
there's going to, they're going to see something for it. There's going to be some benefit that's that's community wide because that that truly is. And and it's it, it the experiment did work. There was talk of wait a minute you're going to really you know, you're going to put our restaurants at a competitive disadvantage. But since the percentage was so low and while you didn't get everything that the town generates, it, it some go some goes in a formula to other other communities on that penny on, on that right. extra. That's bought um, seven five. Yeah, yeah it, it, that's I, that I can could see some frustration, but at the end of the day, it's still uh, making a difference. And there are people from you know, there's, it's a regional center. Uh, Patriot Place is a regional center, and I think that the the allure of Patriot Place and those restaurants and good restaurants is people going to go anyway. I don't think they're going to make the decision based on that. Uh, based on the, on the additional of the meals tax, because it's just, it's too small to see in a bill. Well, I'm, a, I'm an old Reagan Republican, so I'm, of course, against any new tax, but we'll let that one go for okay. another day. Uh, but you're right, absolutely, that uh, did, you know, go directly to what was promised, and it's very visible, and, uh, you know, by virtue of the fact that uh, people can see uh, the beautiful roads and, and drive on them. Uh, there's a reward there that people can feel the pain, but also can see the rewards. So that's a positive, but roads are not always the easiest thing because we've got a situation down at the corner of Walnut and Commercial here in town. And I, I think you're familiar with it. Yes. Uh, it. It's a really rough intersection. And I'll tell you, it, it's interesting because I look at that intersection and you look at the other side of the intersection going into Mansfield, where Fisher Street is, and there's a street light there, and things seem to be relatively safe there. So why can't the same thing be done going north into Foxborough, I wonder? Uh, that's, been an, that's been an issue that's gone on a, for a long time. And when I was a selectman, I dealt with that one too, okay. and so I don't have an answer. But yeah. Yeah. I think it is, uh, whether it be the, an engineering decision or whether it be uniform traffic code, which governs a lot of, which governs most of what you do um, around roads because if you didn't follow, if departments of transportation didn't follow uniform traffic code, then you'd have a speed bump or a stop sign on almost every street. You right. wouldn't be able to get anywhere. But I think what is stopping it is either for safety or engineering is that they can't get a light that close to that particular off ramp just based on the curve of the road right. and the design and the it. proximity to vehicles coming down. Uh, off that in the, in the turn, maybe it's sight lines or some engineering, something has to be done because that is one of the most dangerous intersections. It is I tough. would suggest, and I don't have the numbers, but I would suggest in Foxborough and maybe even southern Norfolk County uh, because it's just, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. Anybody taking that left, having to go through two, uh, two lanes of traffic that's coming on a on a 140 and then wide off the highway. Wide lanes, too. Very wide it's lanes. A very with, wide stretch of road there. With poor sight lines. And then when you look, if you're exiting, taking a left, and you look to your right, you have to look through the uh, rear passenger window to see what oncoming traffic is, is coming. And it's in both, uh, both north and south, they move uh, at a very rapid they rate. They do. They do. It's a, a tough situation. So there's no easy answers on that one. But uh, I'm sure that it's something, uh, something that you'll it's be working on, continue to work on. The, dis the discussions are ongoing, and we hope that uh, through, the, through the intellects involved on the engineering side that we can come up with uh, something that is reasonable uh, for public safety, whether it be a, a limit on when you can take the left right. at, at certain times. Um, you, can't, you, you certainly can't engineer uh, people not to take risks, but you know, I think there's a way to mitigate that problem. And I'd, I'd hope that it comes soon. I hope in, you know, if I'm back here in two years that we're not talking about <laughs> Walnut Street and commercial. Oh, well, hopefully we'll be talking about a success. Uh, and uh, that'll be a good conversation to have indeed, I'm sure. So, uh, Senator Jim Timothy with uh, our, uh, what district are we again? We're I the think. Bristol Norfolk. We're the Bristol Norfolk district. Bristol Norfolk. So, they, they, it's, the, it's the archaic way. In fact, if, you, if, you, if I'm introduced in the Senate chamber, they don't use any proper names. It's not decorum. It's uh, the senator from the Bristol senator and Norfolk, or the Bristol. gentleman. Okay, so uh, the gentleman, uh, Senator Timothy, who is with us, let's talk a little bit about another uh, transportation issue that was, uh, we, I think we had touched upon it last time as being something coming up. It's now come and perhaps gone. Let's talk about the T, transportation. Oh. It, unfortunately, Bob, the T will never uh, go away. There's, 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 there's some fear in me about the public sector empire creating that sometimes government does. I uh, saw it with the big dig. We're still paying for still that. Still paying for that. See it with the MBTA. Uh, I had always said that the T operates, and this is two, two or three years ago, the T operates either 
by a conspiracy of <laughs> ignorance or just just a culture of arrogance because you cannot have be spending 30 percent of your operating budget on debt service and then expand over the last 25 over the last 25 years more than any other major transportation system in the nation with stagnant population growth over those 25 years. The, you know, the same 600,000 in Metro Boston live there, the same 6 million in the Commonwealth of here. We're, you know, we, we're attracting some students, but we're losing anyone who doesn't like the weather. Mm -hmm. So I had been talking about, for my entire political career, I've talking about the insanity uh, that is the T, because when I took the train in to BC High from Canton, I would take it, I would take the commuter rail to the red line. Right. And they're still taking the fare the same way tomorrow and today, the conductor with the little punch card, as they did in 1984. So when you think of that, and I've just been asking them, why are you continually looking to expand when you can't run the system that you have? Even the, the uh, Federal Transportation uh, Secretary came to Boston in 2010. He's like, why would we be a partner with you on any expansion when you can't run what you have right now? And it's, uh, it's the big dig and then the lawsuit that gave us the big dig debt, which is essentially transportation expansion. Mm -hmm. It's big dig mitigation, but what it was was, was the Silver Line, it was the Courthouse T Station, it was many of the, uh, the uh, Rose Kennedy Greenway. Yes. So we have, a, and, and I love the parallel because in 2000, 2001, when we realized it was time to forward fund the MBTA, after 100 years of operation, they decided finally not to give them a blank check. But there were two problems. There was a, a big problem with the MBTA and their debt, and there was a big problem with the school building authority and their debt. School building authority yes. immediately implemented a moratorium. They put a moratorium, and in fact, we were on the list, and we were, I think, number three, and we got frozen. But then, when they got their house in order, we're funded, and it's funded soundly. It, it, it's worked. So, we took a, the, so the powers that be took a penny on the sales tax, one for the MBTA and the other, uh, other for the School Building Authority. School Building Authority has paid back $10 billion in debt in his funding projects because they've limited the scope of what they'll provide. And the T is still expanding to uh, the Greenbush train, which got no extra ridership. They were already all served. Mm -hmm. That was a cost of uh, $600 million. They're planning a $2.2 .2 billion expansion to the South Coast Rail, and there's no ridership from New Bedford or Fall River who are going to take the train every day. And as I say, $2.2 .2 billion, when somebody from the T gives me a number, I double it. So I think it'd be safe to say I would not lose anything in a bet over that coming in under four, under four billion. So just think of what they're in. There are, there are three T stations on the green line and two on the orange line that are coming online. And we had trains that left the red line last year in the snowstorm and couldn't get to the next station. We all remember the February snows and we all remember the lines that we saw in the news. That wasn't a weather problem, that was a human problem, that was a management problem as well. So, from those problems, a lot of changes have happened, but this winter we'll have to uh, see if those changes uh, bring some uh, positive fruit. Well, the, uh, the, the governor has changed out the, the, the people in management. He's instituted a control board. And I'm, I think we're going to be in a lot better position. And I think going forward, I think he's going to bring some austerity measures that are sorely needed at that agency because they really have put us $7.3 billion is what it's going to cost in the next decade and a half in order to get that to a reasonably sound working experience. Wow. $7.3 billion. Maybe we should get the house in order before we think about a lot of expansion. You don't put an addition on when the roof is leaking. Wow. Great analogy. And I'm going to give you the final word. We are so close to being out of time, Jim. There's so many things I really want to talk to you about. I do hope you'll come back again someday soon before two years so yeah. we can uh, talk. We haven't talked about schools. We haven't talked about funding. We haven't talked about your legislative initiatives. I do hope you'll come back. So again, I'm here with Senator Jim Timothy, who is the, Nor uh, the gentleman from Norfolk Bristol. And he uh, has taken the time to share with us his Beacon Hill update. Of course, you can get a hold of Jim directly by emailing him at james.timothy at ma, gotta look, masenate.gov, or you can call him up at the office, 617-722-1222. I know that you've got some uh, 
uh, helpers this year. Uh, anybody uh, in particular, who's your office staff this year that's really pitching in and making it work? Well, if you have an issue with the office, you're going to call, uh, call the 722-122 number, and that's uh, Jonna Cass. Okay. Jonna, Jonna Katz, she is my constituent service director, so she can give you or route you into the right person if you have a very specialized problem. There's a couple in the office who can handle them. If you need to meet with me directly, uh, I can be arranged uh, very quickly out in the district uh, somewhere. If you need to come into the State House, we can accommodate you. You're Love the job. You are super accessible. Uh, you can always uh, be your friend on Facebook, uh, and I, or you can get on his Twitter account, uh, become a follower, and uh, you know maybe he'll be, uh, um, maybe he'll win some Twitter award. I don't know for a number of uh, people following you, but uh, Jim, I give you the last word. Hi. It's been a it's been a pleasure being with you. I always love to have a Beacon Hill update where I'm challenged uh, on what's going on and in your perspective, your friendly perspective. We, we, uh, we disagree sometimes, but it's never uh, disagreeable. It's a wonderful experience. My favorite Democrat, thank you so much for coming Thanks by. Thanks for having me. And take care. And for you folks in Foxborough, I want you to take care also. And by the way, if you missed any of the details, you want to see it again, always check us out at www.fcatv.org. On behalf of all the wonderful volunteers of Foxborough Cable Access, including my camera operators, Betty Travers and Deb Storrs, Paul Beck behind the glass, Jillian Larson, who edits me, and Lauren Batar, who tolerates me, and Michael Weber, who puts us all in order. I'm Bob Hickey, your host, thanking you for watching us. Have a great day, Foxborough.